The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. It's not like any other finance book out there. Housel explains, and this is the premise of the book, that academic finance is devoted to finding the mathematically optimal investment strategies. My own theory is that in the real world, most people do not want the mathematical optimal strategy. They want the strategy that maximizes for how well they sleep at night. Sleeping well at night might mean being reasonable instead of 100% rational, as it's more realistic and lets you stick to your plans long term. This is because you are not a spreadsheet, you're a person, a screwed up emotional person. And in this video, I'll run through my top takeaways. I don't like to give away the entire book. Plus, I think we all take something slightly different away from the books we read, depending on where we are at our journey and what we feel relates to us. I mentioned this before, but my biggest takeaway was that being good with money has nothing to do with how smart you are. It has more to do with behavior than intelligence. Morgan uses the example of a janitor who accumulated an $8 million portfolio. And there are also many high-income earning professionals out there who are living paycheck to paycheck. Morgan writes, Doing well with money has little to do with how smart you are and a lot to do with how you behave. And behavior is hard to teach, even to really smart people. And that a genius who loses control of their emotions can be a financial disaster. The opposite is also true. Ordinary folks with no financial education can be wealthy if they have a handful of behavioral skills that have nothing to do with formal measures of intelligence. This book also gave me an understanding and acceptance that we all manage our money differently and that's okay. How we behave with money has a lot to do with the economic climate that we grew up in. We all do crazy stuff with money because in terms of time, we're all relatively new to this game and what looks crazy to you might make sense to me, but no one is crazy. And there's also a nice little reminder to keep privilege in check and realize that not all success is due to hard work and not all poverty is due to laziness. Keep this in mind when judging people including yourself. Morgan reminded me that the trick when dealing with failure is arranging your financial life in a way that a bad investment here and a missed financial goal there won't wipe you out so that you can keep playing until the odds fall in your favor. And that good investing isn't necessarily about earning the highest returns because the highest returns tend to be one-off hits that can't be repeated. It's about earning pretty good returns that you can stick with and which can be repeated for the longest period of time. That's when compounding runs wild. And there's no reason to risk what you have and need for what you don't have and don't need because you might end up losing it all. He says it's one of those things that's as obvious as it is overlooked. Which brings us to my favorite chapter on enough. Morgan explains that the hardest financial skill is getting the goalposts to stop moving, but it's one of the most important. This is something that I think I'm guilty of and it's a nice little reminder. It's probably why so many people suffer from the one more year syndrome, which is when people continue working for just one more year even though they've reached their financial goals and no longer need the paycheck to make ends meet. And not knowing when enough is enough can come down to social comparison. He says that no matter what, there will always be someone doing better financially than you. The ceiling of social comparison is so high that virtually no one will ever hit it. There will always be someone richer to compare yourself to, which means it's a battle that can never be won, or that the only way to win is to not fight to begin with, to accept that you might have enough, even if it's less than those around you. And the problem with this type of social comparison is that we tend to judge wealth by what we see, because that's the information we have in front of us. We can't see people's bank accounts or brokerage statements. So we rely on outward appearances to gauge financial success. The truth is that wealth is what you don't see. Someone driving a $100,000 car might be wealthy, but the only data point you have about their wealth is that they have $100,000 less than they did before they bought the car or $100,000 more in debt. But true wealth is the nice cars not purchased, diamonds not bought, the watches not worn, the clothes foregone and the first class upgrades to Declined. Wealth is financial assets that haven't yet been converted into the stuff you see. And no one is impressed with your possessions as much as you are. And spending money to show how much money you have is the fastest way to have less money. And beware of taking financial cues from people playing a different game than you are. While we can see how much money other people spend on physical items, we don't see their goals, hours worked, and the stress endured. And I've said this before, when most people say they want to be a millionaire, what they actually mean is, I'd like to spend a million dollars. And this is literally the opposite of being a millionaire. And of course, if you are enjoying this video so far, don't forget to give it a thumbs up or write a comment because it really does help to support my channel. 
People want to become wealthier to make them happier. Happiness is a complicated subject because everyone's different. But if there's a common denominator in happiness, a universal fuel of joy, is that people want to control their lives. The ability to do what you want, when you want, with who you want, for as long as you want, is priceless. It's the highest dividend money pays. And the highest form of wealth is the ability to wake up every morning and say, I can do whatever I want today. And Housel talks about savings in the bank is okay. Savings in the bank that earn 0% interest might actually generate an extraordinary return if they give you the flexibility to take a job with a lower salary but more purpose. Or wait for investment opportunities that come when those without flexibility turn desperate. Savings can be created by spending less. You can spend less if you desire less. And you will desire less if you care less about what others think of you. And very importantly, getting money is one thing, keeping it is another. And another important reminder in the text was to keep your ego in check. Once our needs are met, most spending after that is spent on our ego. One of the most powerful ways to increase your savings isn't to raise your income, it's to raise your humility. Building wealth has little to do with your income or investment returns and a lot to do with your savings rate. Investment returns are not guaranteed, but personal savings and frugality are parts of the money equation that are more in your control and have a 100% chance of being as effective in the future as they are today. The difference between rich and wealthy is that Rich is current income. It's easy to spot rich people. They often go out of their way to make themselves known. But wealth is hidden. It's income not spent. Wealth is an option not yet taken to buy something later. Housel explains that the danger here is that I think most people deep down want to be wealthy. They want freedom and flexibility, which is what financial assets not yet spent can give you. But it is so ingrained in us that to have money is to spend money and that we don't get to see the restraint it takes to actually be wealthy. And since we can't see it, it's hard to learn about it. And you will change. So avoid extreme financial planning as people's goals and desires do change over time. We also want to avoid interrupting compounding unnecessarily. Endurance and minimizing regret are key. And this was a very important reminder to me. Aiming at every point in your working life to have a moderate annual savings, moderate free time, no more than a moderate commute, and at least moderate time with your family increases the odds of being able to stick with a plan and avoid regret. Everything has a price, but not all prices appear on labels. Say you want to earn an 11% annual return over the next 30 years so you can retire in peace. Does this reward come free? Of course not. There is a price tag, a bill that must be paid. And in this case, the price is the never-ending taunt from the market, which gives you big returns and takes them away just as fast. But if you view volatility as a fee, things look different. Morgan explains that the trick is convincing yourself that the market fee is worth it. That's the only way to properly deal with volatility and uncertainty. Not just putting up with it, but realizing it's an emission fee worth paying. I think Die With Zero and this book are must read, so maybe you want to check out this video next. And what were your key takeaways? I'd love to know. Were they different to mine? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for listening. Don't forget you can also find me on Instagram and Facebook.